Let's now apply our knowledge of integration and differentiation of a vector valued function to different aspects of geometry and physics, math, etc. First, let's start with arc length. Arc length of a curve uh, expressed via a vector valued function. Right? So we have some curve. Say we want to look at some segment of this curve between A and B, and it's expressed as a vector valued function. And we want the length of this curve here. How can we compute this? Let's recall arc length in parametric form. Spell arc right here. Arc length in parametric form. Remember we have, so for some curve y equals f of x, we have parametric equations, x equals x of t, y equals y of t. We derived that the arc length given by lowercase s was the integral from a to b of square root x prime of t quantity squared plus y prime of t quantity squared dt. Well, what if we just renamed these things? These parametric equations are just now the functions of our vector value, or they're the components of our vector valued function. So let's say x of t, let's rename u to f of t, and let's rename y of t to g of t. Well, then these are our functions for, uh, or these are our components for a vector valued function. So now in vector value, in vector valued function language, the arc length is simply the integral from A to B of F prime of T squared plus G prime of T squared DT, where R in two dimensions, where R of T is the vector f of t i hat plus g of t j hat, okay? And so these are integrals that we've been doing all semester. You set up the integral for arc length, right? You take a derivative of the x component, you take a derivative of the y component, you square them, you add them up, you take the square root, you take the integral, right? Arc length in 3D is no different. Here, r of t is um, f of t i hat plus g of t, g of t um, j hat plus h of t k hat. And so arc length s, arc length, I'll just abbreviate here for speed, arc length s is given by integral from a to b square root f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared plus h prime of t squared close square root dt. And this is how we compute arc length. One thing we have not done yet though is this is how you get arc length between a fixed distance, right? We picked starting parameter uh, or starting value a, ending value b, we plugged in the function, we found the arc length. We can now define what's called an arc length function. When we consider vector valued functions, let's say we have our curve here, 
let's say we have some fixed starting value A, and we want arc length as T progresses. So we want a function. We say, okay, well, what's the arc length when T is here? But what if T grows a little bit? And now T is out here, and then T grows a little bit, and this arc length is always changing, right? As T varies, the arc length changes. And so now we're just looking at, okay, let's look at values when T is greater than or equal to A, right? And so as T progresses, the arc length is going to get larger and larger and larger, right? It may get smaller if you consider something like a circle where here's A, and as T goes around, you know, it hits some point where it's at a maximum. And then arc length starts to get shorter if you consider this distance. Of course, you'll be considering this distance until you wrap around again. But anyways, so now we want a function for arc length. Well, it is arc length, right? Except now our endpoint is varying. So here's like B1 and then it varies as B2, it varies B3. And so what's variable now is the upper bound. So the function should have a variable in the upper bound. And because of that, we get the arc length function. So if R of T is F of T, G of T, H of T, right? Our arc length function is S of T, which is the integral from A to T. Now our upper bound is T, right? This is a function of T times, or the integral of, uh, integral from A to T of, now we have to use a quote unquote dummy variable here. So it's gonna be F prime of U squared plus G prime of U squared plus h prime of u squared du. And again, u, we say this is a dummy variable, meaning it's just holding, it's a placeholder. Since we don't want to use the variable t again, because now it's a variable in the bound, right? And what's one remark we can make, right? Now we're in the language of vectors now. So we don't need such a long, such a lengthy formula for arc length every time. If you notice, what is, let's look in 3D, what is the square root of f prime squared plus g prime squared plus h prime squared? Well, if r of t is fgh, then r prime of t is going to be f prime of t, g prime of t, h prime of t. And what is this formula then? If you take all of the components of R prime of T, you square them and you add them up. This is exactly the magnitude. So let me erase here just for some room. In the language of vectors, we have a simpler formula. Arc length is simply the integral from A to B of no longer the square root but this is just the magnitude of the derivative of R of T. And so here's a much more concise formula for arc length, right? And this holds in our, an arbitrary dimension, right? Now here, I'm not specifying whether this is two dimensions or three dimensions, but it doesn't matter. It depends on the context and this formula is just as valid. And so um, to, to write our function of arc length in a, in a more concise matter, we can say here now we have our arc length function. S of t equals the integral from a to t, remember t is what's varying, of the magnitude of r prime of u du. And this is our arc length function. And so now we can use this to calculate arc length much faster. You simply take your derivative, which is r prime of t, and then you replace the variable t with u, and then you integrate. And 
plug in T at the end, right? Because it's in your bound of integration. And that gives you some function of the variable T. You notice the variable U will be completely eliminated once you, once you take the integral. Um, and what else can we learn from this? Well, what we can learn from this is if you notice that arc length is the integral of the magnitude of the derivative, what does that mean? That means, moreover, you know, then differentiating the arc length with respect to t is just the magnitude of r prime of t. You know, informally, you could think about taking the derivative of both sides here. And informally, well, by the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, if you take, so if we take ddt on the left, we have to take ddt on the right. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, this ddt integral from a to t, those quote unquote cancel. And so we also have a formula that says the derivative of arc length is the magnitude of the derivative vector. And so we can use this as well. Now that we've discussed arc length, let's talk about curvature. Curvature is an interesting um, property that can be uh, quantified. So curvature. What do we what do I mean when I say curvature? So let's imagine, let's look at just a picture here. And let's say we have some curve like this. Okay. Now, at a given point, let's say this is A, this is B, and some point over here is C. We want to discuss the curvature of um, a curve, right? Something, a curve of curvature zero is a line, right? But how do we define this uh, quantitatively? Well, let's look at a circle. tangent to our curve here. And this circle will have a given radius. Okay, and so let's call this radius R1. And notice this has a bigger radius. And then if we go to a second point here, B, and we take a tangent circle, there's some other radius like R2, which you can see is much smaller here. And so we say the curvature denoted by the Greek letter kappa is greater at B than at A since the radius of this circle tangent to the curve is smaller than the radius at A. You can see it's a, a much bigger circle here at A than it is at B. And that's because it's at B, a smaller circle corresponds to a sharper turn in the, in the, in the curve. So a sharper turn equates greater area, right? And so informally here, kind of intuitively, here's some intuition, is sharper turn equals greater curvature. Right, think about a line. There is no turn whatsoever and the radius for a circle of a flat line is technically infinite, right? You would have to like go infinitely to get a circle. Um, and then you consider something like a parabola, right? This has much more curvature than, than a line because this radius is much smaller than the radius needed to get a circle tangent to a line, right? Um, and then you have something like a sine wave with even more curvature, right? Because you have like 
these circles in here with relatively small radius because there's uh, there's a lot of sharp turning in um, in a uh, sine wave. So intuitively, this is how we can think about curvature. Now let's um, let's figure out how to calculate it. It's a definition. So let's see be a smooth curve given by the function r of s. Now here, we are parameterizing the function by arc length instead of time. We have an arc length function, right? We have, uh, let's just go back here. I'll, I'll explain what I mean, where S is arc length parameter. Let me finish the definition, then I'll explain what I mean, how we can parameterize a vector valued function by curve or by uh, arc length instead of time. Right. And then we say the curvature kappa at S is defined to be kappa equals the magnitude of ET ds, which is the same. So here curvature is kappa equals magnitude dt ds, which is the same as the magnitude of just different notation t prime of s. Okay, so what is this saying? This is saying you have a curve. You look at the magnitude of the tangent vector, okay? And so if you have a sharp bend, then the magnitude of your tangent vector is going to be greater versus if you have a flat curve, okay? And so this is how we define the curvature is you look at the magnitude of the tangent vector parameterized by arc length. So how do we parameterize by arc length? We have S of T is the integral from A to T of magnitude of R prime of U DU. Okay, and then S, right, so let's drop the of t here. Let's just say S equals, right? We know it's a function of t, and that's exactly how we get the parameterization. We have S equals, after we compute this integral, we get some function of t, right? This here is a definite integral, and at the end, there are no u's left because you plug in t's everywhere there's a u, right? And so this is some function of t which means we can express t as f inverse of s, right? And so here we can go interchangeably between parameterizing via t or via s. And this is what we mean by saying like we're, we're parameterizing via arc length, right? If you have some parameter t, well, then you just go this way, you plug it into the function here, and then you have some parameter s, right? And so now you can see that s is parameterizing our curve instead of t. And so this is our equation for curvature. It's the magnitude of the tangent vector parameterized by arc length, okay? And so if you would like this parameterized, by um, time, here's some equivalent formulas. For curvature, we have that curvature is the uh, uh, magnitude of 
t prime of s, well, this is the same as plugging back in for t now. This is the magnitude of t prime of t over r prime of t. And you see you can get that um, from this formula just by uh, a few steps of algebra. What is t prime of t defined to be? Well, if c is three-dimensional, so step from here to here is if c is three-dimensional, then we can write kappa as r prime of t cross r double prime of t magnitude all over magnitude of r prime of t cubed. And so there's relatively simple proofs to go between these equalities. Um, I'll save that as an exercise. Um, and then lastly, curvature and Cartesian coordinates is defined as kappa equals absolute value of y double prime. So like here is just straight up y equals f of x that we're used to, right? This is kappa equals the absolute value of y double prime over one plus y prime squared quantity to the three halves power. So here's another way to calculate curvature, uh, simply just given y equals f of x, right? And now you can see why a line would have curvature zero, uh, kappa equals zero, because if y equals mx plus b, well then y prime equals mx, y equals m, you plug everything in and it has no curvature. So <clears throat> next, I'd like to quickly talk about um, two more things we can get from tangent vectors and namely normal and binormal vectors. And this is for 3D curves. So let's let C be a smooth three-dimensional curve given by R of T. And let's let T of T be the principal unit tangent vector. Okay, so let's say we have, let's get a new page. Here's our curve, C, given by R of T. And we have our tangent vectors, right? I should have been doing this more often. Here's our tangent vectors. And now we want to define unit normal vectors. We define the unit normal vector to be something perpendicular to the tangent vector. We get something perpendicular to the tangent vector by taking the derivative, and we want it to be unit. So we get a unit normal vectors here, um, and we'll give it a name. Sorry, let's just rewrite this here, unit normal vector. Say capital N of T is defined to be the tangent, the derivative of the tangent vector, which gives you something tangent to the tangent vector. So if you're tangent to the tangent vector, you're normal to the curve, right? Um, or not tangent to the tangent vector, perpendicular to the tangent vector. Um, over magnitude t prime of t. And so what is this? This would look like something inward here. So here's t, and here's our normal vector. It's perpendicular to the tangent vector. 
So here's our tangent vector, here's our tangent vector, <clears throat> here's our tangent vector, right? And so, <clears throat> cool. And then we need a unit binormal vector. The unit binormal vector is, remember this is three dimensional. So you can have, if you have a vector, you have something orthogonal to that vector or normal to that vector, then you can have a vector that's orthogonal to both, right? The binormal vector is going to be a vector that is orthogonal to both T and N. So this is the binormal vector, <clears throat> which is defined to be the cross product of the tangent vector and the unit normal vector. This gets you something that's uh, perpendicular to both N and T, right? And you need a third dimension for this. That's why we can't define binormal vectors um, for a curve in two dimensional space. And so here's our binormal vector. And so here you can see how you would compute these. And since we're now familiar with um, taking derivatives and magnitudes, hopefully very comfortable by now, we simply just have to um, refer to these formulas when calculating normal and binormal vectors. And so let's lastly here, so what have we seen? We've seen how to find tangent vectors, how to find normal vectors, how to find binormal vectors. We've learned how to calculate arc length. We've learned how to calculate curvature. I want one more quick application and it's going to be a physics application. And it's motion. We can apply vector valued functions to a physics setting to better describe uh, motion in space in either two dimension, three dimension, arbitrary dimensional space. So let's let R of T be a twice differentiable, meaning the second, the first and second derivative exist, twice differentiable vector valued function representing position of an object. Okay, and so we have position is given by R of T equals F of T, G of T, H of T. So imagine like a, like a particle in a magnetic field or maybe a little more elementary example would be like to consider a fly buzzing around the room, like in three dimensions, right? Um, it has like relative to some origin, say you pick up a spot on the table and that's your origin, right? Well, relative to your origin, this fly has X coordinates, Y coordinates and Z coordinates. And you can map out the position of this fly using these functions of X, Y, and Z um, parameterized by T. So we get this R of T represents our position. Right? <clears throat> well, then, if you've taken uh, physics before, you'll know that velocity, if position is a differentiable function, then velocity is the derivative of position. So if we have that position is R of T, then that tells me that velocity is equal to r prime of t. So we can say we can have a vector valued velocity function, v of t, which is r of t prime, which is f prime of t, g prime of t, h prime of t, right? And so we can calculate velocity using vector valued functions. We just need to be able to represent um, the object's position. We can come up with a formula for speed, which is the magnitude or the absolute value of velocity. 
equals absolute value of velocity. Velocity is a vector because it cares about direction. Speed is a scalar. It does not care about direction. It just cares about how fast. What's the magnitude of your velocity, right? And so speed, we'll call it like sigma of t maybe, is the magnitude of your velocity, which is then square root f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared plus h prime of t squared, right? And if you'll remember, this was ds dt, where s is arc length. And then lastly, we have, so let's, let's recap in full here. We have position r of t equals f of t, g of t, h of t. We have velocity, which is the derivative of position. And we know we can take derivatives component wise. So v of t is f prime of t, g prime of t, h prime of t. We have speed, which is the absolute value of our velocity vector, which is root, or here, let's save the formula and say that this is ds dt, right? Where lowercase s is arc length. And then we can also represent acceleration because again, if velocity is a differentiable function, then acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So a of t is f double prime of t, g double prime of t, h double prime of t. And so here is kind of a nice layout of how we can apply vector valued functions to doing physics and getting some good, uh, finding some good and helpful ways to calculate maybe a little more complicated problems in a physical setting um, for, for motion. So now we've covered fully what I'd like to talk about um, leading up to multivariable calculus. Where do we go from here? From here, we, we're going to now kind of step into the world of multivariable calculus. And that starts by just examining multivariable functions. OK, what's the domain? What's the range? Uh, how does this function behave? And then we can start to talk about limits and continuity. What's the limit of a multivariable function? Uh, when is this function continuous? When is it not continuous? Once we get a grasp of that, we can say, OK, here's partial derivatives. Here's how we find maxima and minima in higher dimensions. Here's how you find critical points. Here's how you do this, do that. Um, and so now that we have the prerequisites out of the way, the next videos will begin our um, series of discussions on uh, multivariable differentiation.